Podcast. I'm your host, Andrea Renee, joined by Alexa Wright Korea. Welcome back, my friend. Hi, everybody. And of course, Christine Steimer joining us again, as always. Hi. Hi. Your lipstick Hi. game is on point today. Thank you. It's new. I like it. I um, decided to feel like fall today. I know. We're in that weird transitional phase where I want to start wearing my sweaters and putting the boots on and I... And all that, you know, really nice cozy gear, but it's still too hot for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, but it's not even like hot, hot. It's like one degree too hot. Yeah. For sweaters. Mm -hmm. it's like you're, you you're okay in the morning and the late evening, but like during the day, it's no. just like sweaty Betty time. <laughs> it's all, I mean, it's always sweaty Betty time for me, but I understand <laughs> what you're saying. I miss oh. it. I miss fall. I miss seasons. Well, fall is right around the corner. Um, our dearest... Brittany Brombacher is still on her honeymoon. She's been posting photos from Bora Bora. It looks beautiful there. I know. Um, she I made jokes that we should move our there. office there. And I was like, girl, <laughs> I wish. I, I mean, you think they get good internet down there? Or do you think it's like... You know, it's a we good question. We could get question. like satellite internet. Because the internet, <laughs> the internet is key. Yeah, it key is. to the operation. But I mean, flying to events would be kind of challenging. And expensive. Who needs events when you got the beach and Dude, a pina colada? I think colada. we would get island fever though. <laughs> a pina colada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we will put it under consideration. Brittany, we hope you're having a lovely time. It sure looks like you are. And congratulations again on your recent nuptials. So um, oh, I want to give a big thank you to everyone who's listening to the show on various pos pos podcast services <laughs> around the globe. We really appreciate you guys tuning into the, the What's Good Games podcast every week. Your show for the nerd inclined. Um, if you guys aren't subscribed to a podcast service for the show, we'd love it if you would subscribe. We're on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, a variety of other platforms. Uh, if you haven't left us a review, that would greatly help us out. You know, give us some feedback. We'd really appreciate that. And thank you to everybody who is hanging in our community on patreon.com slash what's good games. We love you guys. Um, we we'll are, have our streams next week for you guys. Yeah. yeah. So all the girls are going to be here in the Bay Area. What are we going to stream? We haven't decided yet. So we'll put up a post on our Patreon page uh, and ask you guys what you're looking forward to. But thanks to some wizardry that John Drake, my husband, helped me fix in the studio here. We were able to get good audio on our streams now. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Who knew all it took was one little crazy adapter to plug it into this right place, and it's like magic. It About works now. Time. I'm sure something else will go wrong to make up for it. So oh, Don't jinx us, but Alexa. It's on brand. Yeah. It's on brand. I know, yeah. It happens. That's kind of true. <laughs> Um, okay, cool. So let's go ahead and jump into the video game news of the week. There is a whole bunch of stuff happening in Japan right now. Oh, the Tokyo man. Game Show is going on as we speak. Um, who should we start with? I mean, there was a big PlayStation press conference. Square Enix had some news. Um, I have a little bullet point list here, so I'm just going to kind of run down a couple of these. The first one, a new game was announced, Left Alive from Square Enix, and according to Polygon, uh, while the details are still scarce about this title, the people working on the game, including Metal Gear character designer Yoji Shinkawa. You did it. Yay, I did it. Offers Yay. hope for something exciting. Joining Shinkawa on Left Alive will be director Toshifumi Nabashima, whose previous work includes production on the Armored Core series and Chrome Hounds at From Software. Plus, Left Alive's first teaser trailer hinted at a mech action game, reminiscent of Armored Core, in which mechs appear to be transported by military helicopters into a war zone. The game was described as a survival action shooter. It's slated for release sometime in 2018 on PlayStation 4. So, so I believe that they, they came out and said that Left Alive is part of the Front Mission series. Okay. Which is like an older series that we haven't really heard of in a while or something. Um, I, didn't, I did not play Front Mission. But it looks really cool. Nice. Steinberg, did you catch <laughs> the teaser for this? I didn't see. I couldn't find the teaser. I just saw like news articles about it. But I did not look at anything. So I don't know what it looks like. It's very Metal Gear. Metal Gear-y. Like. The first shot is of this hallway and the color palette 
is very reminiscent of like the muted tones of like the Metal Gear games, like where everything is sort of dark and like toned down. And then you see these mechs flying over this like city that looks like it's kind of seen better days. Um, I think it's really cool. I kind of like that Square Enix is picking up all of these or spinning off all of these new IPs and isn't just staying in like their like their like Final Fantasy wheelhouse or their um Dragon Quest or whatever. I like seeing this new stuff, especially coming out of Japan, because this seems like seems like something that would come from its western side more than its eastern side, because almost the entire like all the biz- business divisions are almost focused on mobile games or some kind of some kind of role playing game or some or an action game or something like that. So I'm excited to see what comes out of this one. Um, yeah, I've, I've actually find like you talking about it right now. I'm like, oh, that's a good point, because to me, when I first heard this description, I was like, OK. It's like a new thing. Like, this sounds like almost every other game that's coming out. Um, But it is a good point that Japan has sort of stopped, you know, creating games like that. So, Hmm. all right, maybe maybe I won't be so salty. Maybe I'll try it. (laughs) (laughs) I'm interested in it because the Metal Gear artist is working on it. And, I mean, questionable character design choices aside, quiet. um, (laughs) I I think that the designs are really beautiful. And really cool and really like realistic looking. So I'm excited to see what they do with this one. The trailer, they're not the trailer. The poster has like this woman on it with like this really sad look and this guy with like all this like guns and stuff. And it looks really cool. So hopefully they share more details uh, before 2018 and don't pull like a Death Stranding and give us like a little tidbit and then nothing. I'm intrigued by this game. I want to play it. Well, we will wait with bated breath to see more from Left Alive. Um, Speaking of games coming to 2018, Monster Hunter World got a release date, January 26th, 2018. So that's coming relatively quickly. I guess I didn't anticipate it uh, releasing so soon after it was announced. Um, Alexa, what do you think about Monster Hunter World's release date? Do you think, I, I mean, I think January is probably a pretty solid time to come out, right? So January, January next year starts with Nino Kuni 2, which is like a bajillion hour JRPG. Brittany and I will be AFK. Um, Lost Sphere, which is that second Tokyo RPG factory title from Square Enix. Um, And then in February, there's something else that I'm forgetting, but this one comes right at the end of January. So there's already three big games in January and they're all out of Japan. So they And there's other stuff that's not coming out of Japan that's coming out like- That's coming out in January. Next year. Maybe not January, but like shortly early, after. Early February. A lot of stuff got pushed from this fall to early 2018. Yeah, uh, the the new Dragon Ball game is coming out in February. Far Cry is in March. There's another game in February that I, I that is like on the tip of my tongue, and I'm forgetting about it. But well, next, God of War is supposed to come out in that quarter God of too. War coming out in that quarter, and the Crew Two is out then. Even though that's not really competition for these games, but I keep talking. I have a list. I'm gonna pull it up. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot happening. Q1 has become a really hot release window mm-hmm. it, it kind of feels like q2 like, oh, is the one that's we taking can't get a back it done for fall so <laughs> you just push Let's just push them so that we get them out before the end of the year financials <laughs> that's yeah. all we need yeah exactly exactly um so we also got a trailer a new trailer for the shadow of the colossus remake that is happening um and it looks pretty good uh as you would expect pl- uh, running on playstation 4 the Graphics look crisp and nice, and it certainly um, is a definite upgrade than the original. I would need to get some hands-on time to see how the revamp control scheme is improved, but um, I think that fans of the original are going to be incredibly pleased with what they see. Um, did either of you do to play the original Shadow of the Classes? I did. I'm excited to play it again. Hooray! I got it looking all grainy. Original. <laughs> I played the remaster. The PS3 box. PS3. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I played both Eco and Shadow at that time, and um, I don't, I don't know that I'm excited. Like, I don't think I'm going to play this again unless oh. it does. I don't. I just. I had that beautiful experience. I'm ready to let it sit there, and just me reminisce on it. It's just it's just a matter of time, honestly. Is totally. Why. It's like I just it's just time management. I don't have time to play everything, so something that I've already played is probably going to take a backseat to something that I haven't. I'm interested to see how this does versus how 
The Last Guardian did. Now, I know that, you know, obviously it's a little bit of a different case here because, you know, The Last Guardian was so highly anticipated for so many years. But I kind of feel like Shadow has a bigger fan base. Yeah, it does. Also, The Last Guardian was completely rage inducing. Like some of those puzzles. (laughs) Oh, my God. I'm going to say it. That game was super cute. But some of those puzzles were so freaking obtuse. And that bird dog didn't like did not listen to you. Most mm-hmm. of the time, I know they said, like, as you get to know him, he'll listen to you more. That is freaking false. <laughs> I had to just, I just have bad memories of him not listening and me fault, my little kid falling off ledges because the bird dog didn't do what he was supposed to do. Like, that game was infuriating and definitely had a lot of design problems. Of course, Shadow has a better fan base. I think it was well executed, well designed, and every, I mean, no one no one has to listen to you in that game you're not like guiding a, a ch- large child animal along beside you like you it's just true. ride your horse into the sunset and get shit done and so. you don't have to hold someone's hand either no hand, hand holding hand yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah, you and horsey I agree with you on last guardian like, i was screaming at my television at certain points like <laughs> i i was just infuriated i was like I'm a tree coke. No, get go there. And he'd be like, "What? I want to go over here." And I'm like, "What the fuck are you doing?" It's like it's like training. It's taking ten hours because I can't make him do what I want him to do. It's like training a real animal, except worse. I know. Except <laughs> worse. Because you can't pet it. Um. So I have my. I'm to talking about our beginning of next year conversation. I have my full list in front of me. Nino Kuni 2, January 19th. On the 23rd, Lost Sphere, 26th, Monster Hunter, 30th, Dissidia. Dragon Ball in February, Secret of Mana on the 15th, Far Cry 5 on February 27th. The Crew 2, March 16th. Yakuza 6 on March 20th. Also in spring, Kirby for Switch. Vampire, God of War, um, also supposed to come out in Q1. Bloodstained, Crackdown, Sea of Thieves, Spider Man, State of Decay, Jurassic World Evolution, and maybe Red Dead Redemption 2. That's 19 oh games That's if you Q1. were counting like I was. That's Q1. And I feel like a lot of these, like, I can see Red Dead going into Q2, Q3. I can see State of Decay 2 slipping, maybe Spider-Man. Yeah, I'd be surprised if Red Dead actually stayed in Q1. Take your time. Just take it. Yeah. If you got to slip, yeah. just slip. Take your time. I, I feel like Red Dead re- belongs in holiday next year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or at the very, like, yeah, earliest, maybe, like, that. September or May. Right, but before that, mm -mm. give us some time. (laughs) Give us some time, Rockstar. um, When did Redemption come out? The first one was it? Was it in a May? I thought it was May. Many moons ago. I don't. I don't remember. But Rockstar does like May for a release release window. But um, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Instead, let's go yeah. backwards in Ooh, time. That gave me acid reflux to, reading that list. To Final Fantasy IX. Yay! <laughs> on PlayStation Four, Alexa, did, were, did, were people asking for this game? Yep. She's like, yes. She's like, I was. <laughs> me and Brittany were. Me and Brittany were just se- quietly seething and raging and hoping. Final Fantasy IX, one of the most underappreciated Final Fantasies of the Final Fantasy franchise. Also, nine is just like nine never got any special treatment. Like people always wax poetic about eight. I feel like if you're the person who says Final Fantasy Age, your favorite Final Fantasy, you are a man child specifically. <laughs> you had even if you're not. You have you have this ideal. You probably have this ideal view of 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 relationships and what your ideal man or woman should be and what your ideal rival should be like. We'll have a larger talk about this, okay. but I I, I have a <laughs> okay. thing about Final Fantasy VIII. But- well, some some details about this. So obviously, this came out on PS3 already, um, complete with HD cutscenes and character models for the PS4. In addition to trophy support and autosave functionality, this release will have seven booster features, including a high speed mode and an option to turn off random encounters, as well as a booster that lets you automatically master the weapons and gear you have equipped. So they added baby ass baby mode. Hey, maybe people like me who are afraid of Final Fantasy. (laughs) Why are you afraid? Go, you know what? I don't that's a big that's a big intimidating franchise that I, you know, maybe don't want to spend the time to learn. Maybe they're like, hey, but you over there, you see that Final Fantasy 15 was cool and now we're releasing this older cool one too. Maybe we want to help you get into the franchise. Girl, I love baby ass baby mode. I am a frequent user of baby ass baby mode. Then what's going on? Why you why are you sweating? I just me? call it, I call it baby ass baby she's, mode. Yeah, I don't think it's a because negative. Because the ass, because it it's like the baby, negative. like when you're saying someone is like a crazy ass blank, 
like the ass on baby on the first baby is an emphasis of like how how mm, much of a handicap double baby. Is. Honestly, okay. this might be. I I lied. I know I double keep saying baby. I want to start you at maybe Final Fantasy six, but I feel like with these like with these additions and this ability to sort of get around some of the more like snooze fest I've never done this before features this might be the first Final Fantasy we get you to play and maybe okay. we can do it soon okay maybe we could stream will it, it be the first Final Fantasy I finish because <laughs> I've started a lot of them <laughs> finish, final, finish, final finish fantasy who knows no I think I think it's good and nine is I'm glad that they added all of those because nine and Brittany will agree with me nine is dense nine is extremely long I think nine is longer than seven and it's just, it's like, it's like five seasons of Game of Thrones in, in four discs. Nope. And it's just rise and fall no. and rise You're and fall and rise and fall. not want to play it No, now? it's great. It's not as weird as Game of Thrones. There's like cool, cool um, uh, black mages that have existential crisis about their existence and a cool princess who has a bunch of powers and a six-year-old who lives with the Mughals in abandoned ruins and an hermaphroditic I, creature that likes to catch frogs and is probably the wisest creature in the entire Final Fantasy franchise. Hmm. What? Okay. Quinna, I do what you, I do what, best quote, I do what I want, you have problem. Okay, so you're do not you? really selling me on it, but that's no, okay. No, it's so we good. Can, we, can shelf it for, we can shelf it for another time. Oh, I fucked up. <laughs> Moving on, Zone of the <laughs> Enders, the second runner, will be remastered for PS4, complete with VR support. The title will be released as Anuba's Zone of the Enders Mars in spring 2018 in Japan. The upcoming remaster will feature 4K support, updated sound design, and brand new features that have yet to be detailed. VR support. Cool. It was nice to see Ooh. the PlayStation talked about PSVR at TGS. I know that um, some people, and by some people I mean Greg, my co-host on Kind of Funny Games Daily, who thinks that PSVR is nowhere to be found. I'm like, they're clearly talking about it. It's a platform. Oh my God. Um, there were so many PSVR announcements in their yeah. press conference. Japan, I'm jealous, is getting a, a Sony concert experience, and it's a VR experience that is a concert of a bunch of songs from sony first party games that's so wait cool. what so, so you like put it on at your like you're at your house and you just yeah. put it on and then you see a concert and there's like a it's a concert experience so i guess it will have like images or or stuff to accompany it but it's it like has, fantasia yeah it's like fantasia but it's songs from sony sony games like um uh the the cover or the key art that they have for it is cat from gravity rush on it and she's like oh, and she's like playing a violin and wearing like a concert dress um, see to me that's, that's so cool. more interesting and like use of vr that i would be interested in not enough to like buy the thing because it's expensive but i think i like to me i'm like oh yeah like a couple hours experience something that you wouldn't normally be able to get if you can't go there but i'm not that into it for video games personally also coming to playstation vr a virtual reality experience for the cat collecting sim neko atsume <sighs> Of course. Okay, it sounds really cute. That's great. That's great. That's just brilliant. That's print money. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. There's a cat collecting sim? I think oh this God. might... Will this be my first... Did you not know about this? Wait a minute. Did no. You... I have oh, no idea what this is. You didn't know about Neko Atsume? The, Alexa, do you hear you. what you're saying out loud? Of course I didn't know about this. So I don't on... know anything about Japanese games. So it's, it's mobile. It's on mobile. Okay. And it's literally... And Atsume literally means like to gather. So it's cat gathering. And you have a little house with, and you spend the money that you earn in game on like catnip and cool bowls and, and, and stuff. And you use it to attract cats to come live in your house. And so I get to like, be a virtual cat lady. Yes. And there's like special yes. cats, like cats with monocles and top hats and what cats wearing cats filled with smaller cats. I don't know. Like it's just, it's a pregnant. This cats. is your perfect game. Andy. Yeah. Like this might be your game of the year. You probably download it right now. Okay, I'm going to download it, you guys. I'll report back next oh week. Oh, my God. It's been out for a while. I'm so surprised. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Goodbye I'm forever, <laughs> life. <laughs> Goodbye forever, indeed. <laughs> um, okay, so Noctis will be featured in Dissidia Final Fantasy Noctis. NT. Uh, what is what yeah. does this mean to you, Noctis lover, Alexa <laughs> Ray? <laughs> well, it means that my good old friend Ray Chase continues to be gainfully employed by Square Enix. And uh, Ray plays Noctis, FYI. Um, but it... I I love the Dissidia fighting games. I liked the ones on the the PSP. God, that was forever ago. And then yeah, I played, and then every time I've been back to Japan in the past couple of years, I have played 
the arcade version. And I really like the arcade version. I like that they're adding Noctis because it sort of sounds like if they're adding him now, then maybe with this particular fighting game, there's room down the line for them to add more characters or maybe they'll plan to add more DLC characters or do like... Proctolius! Yeah. Pro- pro- or do like... <laughs> or do like what... Um, do like what, you know, Street Fighter does and like adds a new character like every every few months. Um, or like what... Nintendo does with arms. That's really cool. I like Noct- Noctis. I like his fighting style. Not in first person, as I've said on previous podcasts, but I do like like the the strategy that his warp strike sort of adds to a fight. So this will be fun. I won't play the heck out of that game. It's going to be great. <laughs> All right. Hi. And uh, lastly on the list here, I have Dragon's Crown Pro was officially revealed for uh, PlayStation 4, I believe. Um, did I miss any of the big announcements? No. From yeah, TGS, not that so. I know of. Yeah, I think I got. I think I got most of them. They did announce, other than the Final Fantasy wine. Yes, that oh, I yeah. purchased. Wait, so do you have it in your possession right now? It is on its way. I bought it. I my cart. My credit card was charged. <laughs> They're Wait, coming we'll have it for next week. May if we have it for next week, we should totally try it. There's yes. Ifrit Rouge and Shiva Blanc. I Shiva, that's my these. middle name. And I'm gonna really. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. I don't know. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and she's like yeah. Shiva, destroyer of yeah. worlds. Yeah. Um you look so cool. cool. That's, me. That's you. Well, we will we will definitely uh be tasting some Final Fantasy wine, whether it be <laughs> next week or the week after. Um speaking of Final Fantasy news, Final Fantasy 15 comrades got a release date. Uh y- players will be able to create their own avatar and join up with three other friends to take on epic quests and battles in the game's first and only online multiplayer expansion starting October 31st. I'm kind of unnerved that their uh, their advertisement said first and only because that implies that there's more. <laughs> oh, I didn't even think about it that way. But that being said, I mean tricky tricky. That being said, as much as I was like, why is this happening? I'm just going to play it. Because the thing I didn't realize when I was like, we don't are. need this. <laughs> because I, I, I put my fingers in my ears and rolled around on the ground and was like, why is this still happening? What's going on? Um, it's it. There's a, a thing that happens late in the game and there's a 10 year time skip. And this DLC takes place within that 10 year time skip. So there's like a bunch of story content okay. that you're missing out on if you don't go play it. But so, you're not playing yeah. as them. You are playing as a member of the King's Glaive. The King's Glaive are the elite, uh, the elite bodyguards of the royal family of Lucius. So it's all of the guards and knights, basically, with the cool special powers that were left behind after um, this big 10-year time skip have happened and Noctis disappeared for 10 years. Um, if you watched Final Fantasy XV King's Glaive, the movie, that movie like introduces you to the King's Glaive and explains what they are and what they do. Um, so you play as one of them and you run around the world and hunt monsters with friends. Cool. Yeah. Your cool powers. And Do stuff. you want me to be your friend? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There was only one, monsters. there was only one right answer there. You, 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 <laughs> if you, you were like, no, I was about to be like, I rage quit this <laughs> <No>. podcast. <laughs> Um, actually, <laughs> um, actually I think my party's full. <laughs> you don't even know how to use warp strike. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I don't. I'll teach it's you. okay. I'll She'll teach you. Teach you. Yeah, exactly. Girl, exactly. I'll teach you. Um, so one of my um, n- new favorite games that has come out recently, well, technically still in early access, Fortnite has a new mode. I know, I know we didn't really get a, a whole lot of chance to talk about this. So Battle Royale Battle is Royale. a new mode coming to Fortnite. And they've announced it is going free to play. So... It's coming for uh, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PC players on September 26th. And it is a 100-player PvP mode, and it will be available for free. So this mode is very much in uh, the vein of Player Unknown Battlegrounds. It's a battle royale, very similar in concept. But what I like about this versus what PUBG is doing. And we're going to talk about my PUBG impressions because I got to play it on um, an Xbox One Me X. Too. Um, uh, in the next section of the podcast, but um, based off the trailers and things I've seen for this mode in Fortnite, is that it doesn't. It's not just you know collect stuff, scavenge for things, and then you know sh- find people to shoot. 
you actually, in, they're incorporating the building elements of Fortnite, which I think is so exciting. The idea that you can set traps for people and you can build yourself like a lookout tower and really kind of embrace what that game is all about and the base building aspects and the tower defense aspects of that game and then combine that with, you know, this kind of free-for-all battle of trying to uh, pit all of these players against one another. I'm super excited to check this out. Um, it uh, it looks really neat. Steimer, I know you also played quite a bit of Fortnite. What do you think about uh, this mode, Battle Royale? I am intrigued because, as you say, like, the building is not really a thing that you do in PUBG. However, I'm concerned, like, because, I mean, I can't imagine building under stress, like, and being like, do I have time to build this tower or is someone about to come up from behind me and shoot me right now? I don't know. But I like the idea of like lay, trying to lay traps for people. It'll depend on how visually obvious they make them in the world. Because otherwise you could just be like, well, there's a trap. I will walk around it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but and the other thing that I'm curious about. So PUBG, I have not actually played. I know that you guys just did. But I talk with people who, a lot who play it. It seems like the basic strategy of it is, is yes, you go around, you loot, and you find stuff, but you're trying to not interact with people as much as possible for a good chunk of the game until it gets down to, like, the last 10 people. And that's only when you really fight, um, unless you happen to run into somebody along the way. So I'm, like, I'm just curious to see how these modes on paper sound extremely similar. I want to see the difference in gameplay style and see what people do with it. Yeah, me too. Um, and we'll be able to check it out for free. So if you guys are interested... Is it just that mode? Just this one free? mode. Uh, okay. Yeah. So because when you get dropped in, you have only your pickaxe. So that's why it's it's separated from the rest of Fortnite, where you have like a collection of, you know, defenders and um, your heroes and everything else, oh, like your inventory and your weapons and your schematics and all that stuff. Um, so so will you be able to pick who, what you look like or are you just randomized? That's a great question. I don't have an answer for you. I could guess that um, you would maybe pick your gender and that's about it. Um, and then from there on out, it's I think you get to like pick up pieces in the world to kind of outfit yourself. So does the did they say whether or not like so the thing in PUBG is like the battlefield shrinks or the battlefield mm -hmm. changes and you have to like move around a lot? Will this just be like are they just is it just on a map and the map is just the map the whole time or are they going to do something similar where you have to like move around? I believe it has the same mechanic where the circle shrinks okay. over time, kind of forcing players into the specific mm. area of the map in order to make sure that people aren't randomly off on the edge of the world, like not doing anything, just hiding. Um, I'm really good at hiding, but not so great at building things. It's okay. You just got to practice. Practice I'm, building I, things. We could do it together. It'll be fun. You build, I hide. Done. So speaking of Fortnite, since we're talking about this new mode, we have to talk about the news this week that um, Xbox One X and... No, excuse me. Not Xbox One X. Xbox One and PS4 Fortnite players uh, were sleuthed out by people on Reddit. Uh, it was discovered that they were playing against each other in a Fortnite match. What? No. Yeah. But we've been told that's impossible. <laughs> well, well the way, I like the way they figured it out, though, which was through the usernames. Yeah. So they saw, I think that they saw a space in someone's name, and they're like, that's not possible on PlayStation. And so they went and they looked up the tag ah. and saw it on, it was on Xbox tag. <gasps> mm -hmm. And like... Our reality so. is crumbling. <laughs> so clearly this is a big deal uh, for a lot of people. Um, other developers like Psyonix who make Rocket League have said, hey, we just have to flip, flip a switch. We just need permission from PlayStation to do so. Oh. Um, so this is a big kind of snafu, right? So Epic Games, a big partner for PlayStation, obviously a big partner for Xbox as well, you know, creators of the Unreal Engine. Um are in a unique position where they probably got their wrist slapped. They said it was a configuration issue, um, but have proven that it's possible. So I think we can only at this point hope that someone somewhere inside PlayStation is talking to Phil Spencer and his team and saying, okay, listen, clearly people want this thing. Um, how do we make it happen? And I think the problem though, is that the reason why it isn't happening quicker is 
maybe I don't know if it's like stubbornness or pride or what, but I know that, for example, like if I want something a specific way, but then a bunch of people are like, well, no, you're wrong. You should do it this way instead. Sometimes instead of being able to openly admit, okay, hey, maybe you're right. Maybe I am doing it wrong. You get defensive. You dig your heels in and you get kind of mad about it. And you're like, this is the position I have and I'm going to take it and you're not going to take it away from me. And maybe that's kind of where PlayStation is right now. They want people to make their friends go out and buy their console Because they want all their friends playing on their console. They don't want them playing with their friends that have an Xbox, but not a PlayStation. It's ding, 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 ding. It's a sales thing. It's purely a a sales thing. thing. Yeah. It's just like what, because you can't really explain from a business perspective why it would be a good move for PlayStation. It would be a good move. Good, like more, uh, not morale wise, but like, um. I don't know what you would call it because my brain is fried. But, uh, you know, like a goodwill amongst the community builder, but it wouldn't yeah. necessarily move the needle on any of their... Um, no. I almost said OKRs. Like, oh my <laughs> <God>. <laughs> are, well, are you using jargon, <laughs> Steimer? Oh, God. <laughs> that would oh. benefit. Allowing that kind of crossplay would benefit everyone but Sony. Like, Xbox and PlayStation can do the crossplay with PC because PC is not a threat to either of their... Their right. console ecosystem. Well, Microsoft has Windows, so I mean, yeah. if you're playing on PC, you have Windows. But like, well, more than likely, the second they open it up to crossplay, like all those people that like maybe wanted to play the 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 casual gamers that buy one console every generation, maybe because all their friends are playing Call of Duty on Xbox or are playing Destiny Two on PlayStation, they make sure that they have the thing in the game so they can go play with their friends. But if you can play like, for example, Destiny Two crossplay on both consoles, then you know this player who only has an Xbox but all his friends are playing it on PlayStation doesn't have to go out and make that four hundred dollar purchase. And Sony has just lost four hundred dollars. Like it's an ecosystem thing. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. they really are in a position where they have the high ground here, where they're like, why would we do this? What what benefit is it of us? Uh, to us and you know that's unfortunate for us as fans because I want to believe in a world where I could finally play with my friends who have guardians on Xbox one the idea of destiny 2 crossplay would be incredible but um I I get that there's a a bunch of hurdles as to why they don't want to do it from a business perspective. But it was interesting how quickly it came and went um earlier this week and um I think it's good that to kind of stoke the flames, but I would say don't get your hopes up because I don't think crossplay between the consoles is going to happen. Now, more games that do crossplay between PC and console, I think, is a possibility. Uh, I think we will see more games that do PS4, PC crossplay, and obviously Xbox One and PC crossplay is is happening now as well. So, fingers crossed for that. But in the meantime. Uh, we will check out the Battle Royale mode in Fortnite. It is coming for free next week on September 26th. And with that, that'll wrap up our news segment for Wait, the week. Oh, Steiner, really? yes. We're not going to talk about the Tomb Raider movie? Oh, oh dang. We, we that's can. Right. We can talk about the Tomb Raider movie. So a brand new trailer dropped this week showcasing um, the new leading lady whose name I always mispronounce. Alicia Vagdick. Alicia v- Vikander? <laughs> See? Vikander. <laughs> I don't know if it's right. I know. I always mess it up. Um, she is looking pretty great. It's crazy how almost shot for shot so much of it is it, with, it's the, totally, with the video game, right? IGN did a really great shot by shot comparison of scenes from the Tomb Raider reboot and scenes from the trailer. And some of them are like shot for shot. The way she turns, the way the angle when she pulls back her bow. Like it's they paid such attention to that reboot. They have her pickaxe in it. They have like the boat with the thing. Like, like it's it sounds like the it sounds like the story is a little bit of a mix between the Tomb Raider one reboot and, and Rise of the Tomb Raider because the whole following in your father's footsteps was something that came later, but they have it in this one. It looks so good, and she looks she looks so good. She has that look of just like wild eyed, like I went over my head, but am I really? Like look on her face, and it's just so good. Ah, I, I only watched it once, but the, my favorite part I think was. When she like hits her head on this freaking tree and falls down, and I'm like, "Yep, it's got to be. A, she's got to take some damage. She needs a concussion at least once in this movie because oh, yeah. she's had about twelve in the games." I wonder if they're actually going to do that impalement scene where she falls uh, on the rebar. 
Do you remember that yeah. in the very yeah. beginning I of the game? Imagine. Like I don't you think would do that. I'm sorry, you'd be dead. Like I right, that was no, that was my one of my gripes about the game is that she like takes all of these crazy injuries and then is able to like climb to the top of this satellite tower or whatever. I'm like, come on, come on. Come on. She would be down for the count if she had if she was impaled by rebar. Like yeah. first off, you'd be lucky if you missed internal organs. Yeah. <laughs> like That's and true. then second, you'd probably bleed out. Like if you pull that out, you don't know what's going on. Never pull out something you've been impaled with. That's what she said. Go to a doctor first. Alexa's it's behind back. my back because my back is busted. Um, go to a doctor first, please. Like PSA. Yeah. So um, are you excited then for the movie? Apparently you are. I think I'm, I like this actress a lot. And I never really watched any of the old Tomb Raider movies, but I'm going to watch this and fingers crossed it'll be good. We could use a good video game movie. I think for we are head. desperately seeking one. I had high hopes for the Assassin's Creed film in it. <laughs> the fast Assassin's Creed? Man, I did not, did not did do you call well. It the Assassin's Creed? Yeah, because it was Michael Fassbender's Fast Assassin's Creed. Oh, I know. Creed. I like that. <laughs> Aren't Michael Fassbender and Alicia Vikander dating? Are they? This is not a celebrity gossip show, oh, Steimer. Sorry. It could be. Like, do you want to? Should we have a new, new segment, everybody? Bad, just bad, super, bad superhero, bad video game movies together. <laughs> I have I have high hopes for for the Tomb Raider movie. It looks really good. Yeah, I'm hopeful too. Well, we'll have to do a segment on it when it comes out eventually, like we did for Wonder Woman. It'll be excellent. We'll yeah. go to the movie theater at 9.30 in the morning oh with God. a thermos Drink full mimosas. of mimosas <laughs> oh and make God. it happen. <sighs> okay, now for realsies. Uh, we have a lot of games to talk about in our hands-on section. So, ladies and gentlemen... Stay with us. We're going to take a really short break, and then we will be right back. This episode of What's Good Games podcast is brought to you by TakeThis.org. Most of us spend a lot of time thinking about our bodies. Gain a little weight, lost a little weight, back hurts from sitting at a desk too much, stomach hurts from too much avocado. But how much time do you spend thinking about your brain? There are a lot of simple things you can do every day to keep your brain in shape. Take breaks from work, get enough sleep, drink water, put down those screens. It sounds simple, but taking care of your body's needs can actually help your brain too. It's all connected. And sometimes your brain needs more help and that's okay. This is just one of the things we learned from our friends at TakeThis.org. Take This has been working to bring the mental health care community and the video game community together since 2012. If you or someone you love is feeling not okay and could use a little advice, visit them at takethis.org. And if you have the resources to donate or volunteer, takethis.org is where you do that too. It's okay to not be okay. Take this. Dang it, Steimer. Where's the face? You said you were making a face. I want to see it. I was doing that. Perfect. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is the What's Good Games podcast, and this is our awesome hands-on what you play in segment of the show. Um, Alexa and I have gone to a couple of preview events. Uh, and, uh, before we get to that, though, Steimer, you got to play Cuphead. I did. Well, because I also went to We all went uh, to the same Xbox. event, but yeah, not in the same city. Places. We yeah. played the Cuphead. Yeah, we did. Would so, you like to explain what Cuphead is? So, oh. <laughs> for those who don't no. know the joys, it, is it possible Cuphead. that there are people listening to this podcast that don't know what Cuphead is? Raise your hands. Okay. They're like in their cars, <laughs> they're raising. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Cuphead, yes. Uh, let's talk about the game that's been in development for five years, it was, I think. It was announced with the Xbox One, wasn't it? It was announced. Was it that long ago? Yeah. And people were like, oh, look at this crazy hand drawn thing. And then they were like, oh, crazy hand-drawn things take a really long time to make when there's only two dudes making it. Yeah. It's coming out, like, this month. September finally. 29th is what the release date of Cuphead from Studio MDHR Entertainment. So Cuphead... It, yeah, go ahead, Alexa. Tell us what it is. It's a... It's a game development about a guy whose head is a cup. <laughs> development began in 2010. Sorry to mean to talk over you. That's why. So you wait, hold on. What did you what what did you say? It's a game about a guy whose head is a cup. Okay. A cup head. So that's a little reductive. We're holding hands now. We're holding hands now. <laughs> There's so also right. you could also be 
Mug man. Your hands mug, are and very wide. Your head is a mug. Nice. I'm like all bread. What's going on? Okay. You're anyway. laughing too hard. <laughs> no, yeah. So you're, you're cu- <laughs> Cuphead and Mug Man and you fight. It's all boss battles. Mm, Mostly boss battles. Not, yeah. It's interesting. The levels I played, I played three or four different levels and they were all slightly different. Uh, there are a lot of boss battles, though. Do tell us about those levels. So you play, the play. Wikipedia entry says it's a run and gun game where the player loses a bet with the devil and spends the game attempting to repay the bet. The game features a branching level sequence and is based around continuous boss fights. Yep. You have infinite lives and keep weapons between deaths. Cuphead has a parry ability and parrying various color-coded objects will fill up a special meter that will enable Cuphead to perform a special move. The levels are accessible through an action RPG style overworld with its own secret areas. And it has a two-player cooperative mode that adds another human player to the single-player boss battles playing as Mugman. Yes. Yep. Yes, it does all of those things. And those it's got true. this great like 1930s animation art style. Uh, a clarification on the infinite lives thing. When you're fighting a boss, like you can die. You have like three lives, but when you die, you just get kicked back to the overworld and you can immediately go in and try again. Okay. Yeah. But, and if yeah. you're playing with someone, and so it's, it's H, it says HP. Like you have a certain amount of HP. Once the HP goes down, you die. But if you're, if you're playing with another person, they can parry, AKA, I think it's double A. You hit A twice. Um, mm-hmm. You can revive them back with one HP. So I, I was playing with one of the PR. Guys, he's not PR, but whatever. One of the Microsoft guys, and um, we had like a little thing going at one point where we're like I was reviving him, and then he died, and then I revived him, and then like we would just kind of like run back and forth and do that. If you're fast enough, you can do that. Um, and then there were also several times where we both just died. So because <laughs> I heard it, it's a very difficult game. It's hard. Yeah, I heard it. Nah. The difficulty is not for the faint of heart. No. It isn't. However, I will say I felt progress. Like every time I died, I didn't necessarily feel like I was hitting my head against a wall, which mm-hmm. was a nice like I was I was expecting to feel like I was really frustrated. Uh, and I actually didn't. And I maybe that's because I was playing with somebody who knew the game a little better than me. And he was very patient with me and teaching me. But um, I actually had a really good time with it. And I liked that the levels were a little bit varied. So I played three different things. One where your airplanes. Did you guys do that one? I played like, airplanes. Airplanes. Uh, so it's side-scrolling, continuous moving. Like you are an airplane shooting across the screen at a boss. Things are flying at you. You're trying to avoid them. Or... Um, like it mentioned in the Wikipedia page, this was a thing I didn't really master that much, but if you, if a pink thing flies at you and you parry it, it will boost your Mm -hmm. super meter. Although (laughs) I had a really great klutz moment where I had the super meter and he was like, use it, use it. And I accidentally turned the wrong way and used it the wrong way. And I was like, crap <laughs> sorry i told you i wasn't very good at this there's too many things happening on the screen it's like an assault to my senses but um so i did that one then there was like more of an, an what i would call normal level where you're it's a bit more platformy um there's a lot of enemies you need to shoot still but in that instance i switched to like the shotgun spray because you can have different types of guns you have two different types of guns um that you can equip with things from the store that you buy like there's actually a lot of things going on here that I didn't realize when I first played Cuphead I thought it was just like oh it's just it's just a side scrolling shooter that's really hard but there is more it's got it's an onion it has layers okay very cool <laughs> isn't there an onion boss no it's a carrot I'm, it's a carrot it's I played the boss. carrot too he was a jerk oh the thing I wanted so I I like a lot of people are probably a little bit intimidated by this game. There is, it's not a super baby mode, but it's called simple mode. And it basically means that the bosses will be slightly reduced in length. So instead of three phases, or instead of five phases, the boss might have three phases. Mm-hmm. That is definitely how I'm going to be playing this game because I just, Same <laughs> I know my limits. <laughs> Nothing wrong with baby ass, baby mode. Baby ass, Nothing baby wrong. mode. Nothing 100%. wrong. 100%. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, so this is obviously highly anticipated for a lot of people. It's an Xbox One exclusive. The art style looks great. Um, I Am 8-Bit is doing uh, an original soundtrack uh, mm-hmm. for the game, which sounds cool. And overall, I'm excited to um, to, to give it a whirl. I, you know, a lot of people have, have been looking forward to this game for a long time. So um, 
cool. It's coming out soon, next week. Um, moving on, other games that we played at the Xbox showcase that we went to. We played PUBG. We played Player Unknown Battlegrounds on console with it a happened. controller. It happened. So I played with the Xbox One Elite controller. Ooh. And the very this, I had never played a single round of PUBG on PC. Not one. Never tried it. Saw it at the Xbox showcase. Was like, okay, definitely got to sit down and try this game out. What's the hype all about? It's now surpassed Dota 2 in all-time concurrent users uh, for the highest peak concurrence, I should say, which is incredible. I never thought that that would happen. So they are just on fire over there. Sat down, picked it up. Did my first match. Killed two people in my first oh, match and good. made it into the top 20. Wow. Ooh. I was told by people who play PUBG that this is an excellent score. Yes, you are. That is, that, I mean, for the first time playing, you done good, kid. Thanks. So this, to me, is a testament to the importance of playing on a format that you're comfortable with. Because I guarantee you, if I had gone into PUBG for my first match with mouse and keyboard, I would have got wrecked. I probably would have died right away. I wouldn't have been able to hide or run or shoot people as nearly as effectively as I did. And it makes me even more excited for the launch of this game later this year. Alexa, what did you think? So the first time I played, I didn't understand what I was doing because no, there was nobody there to tell me what I was doing. So I, I, I was running around hitting people and nothing was happening. And I didn't realize that it was like the loading area. And then all of a sudden... Oh, the lobby? Yeah. And then I became an airplane. <laughs> and I was like, I'm in an airplane. When do I leave the airplane? And I was playing I was playing at a demo station next to Giant Bomb's Brad Shoemaker, who then proceeded to coach oh, me through my first... I love Brad. Brad's great. Coach me through my first playthrough of PUBG. And I was like, why am I suddenly in an airplane? And he's like, you're not the airplane. You're in the airplane. I'm like, well, when do I leave the airplane? And you have to like leave the airplane... And I was like, where do I go? And you have to like control your descent and gather your stuff and then run for the thing. And my first round, I was in a seemingly abandoned area and I had a frying pan and like a motorcycle helmet and some pants. And I was really excited. And I was running down an some empty pants. road. And I was running down an empty road towards the, the battleground. And everything seemed like it was going okay. People were dying. The, like the numbers were going down. I was number like 68 or whatever. And then like a moped came out of nowhere and just ran me over and I died. Aww. And I was really sad because I was having a lot of fun running down the street with my frying pan. So the second time I loaded in, I found my frying pan again. I killed one dude. And then I with would... The frying pan? Yeah. I killed someone. With, I snuck up on them and killed them with a frying nice. pan. Nice. Wow. It was like That's a cast cool. iron. It's like a cast iron frying pan. It is now my skillet. weapon of choice. A cast iron skillet. I would recommend getting a gun instead. Yeah, but I, I am... <laughs> I am Pro frying pan. Because I found a gun. I was scavenging. So I deliberately picked an area of the map that I thought maybe people wouldn't waste their time. Fly mm -hmm. to, I stayed in the airplane for a pretty long time before I decided to parachute out. Um, and I you know, was very stealthy trying to get into the first building, making sure no one was around. I, I did the thing where I closed all the doors to make sure people didn't see that somebody had been in the house yet. And um, I found a room with a gun and I decided to just kind of wait for a little bit. So I'm waiting for a couple of minutes and then I see somebody like run by outside. So I, I'm hiding in the room and crouched down. I have my gun pointed at the door because I'm like, okay, cool. This person has no idea that somebody's already scavenged the house. They're going to come into this room and I'm going to shoot them as soon as they open the door. And it worked. They walked in, they opened the door, bam, I shot them in the face and they died. And they had all kinds of cool stuff. They had a special <laughs> coat, pants, they had grenades, pants. they had a walkie talkie, they had a backpack, they had everything. They were decked out. They were probably so mad wow. that I was in that room waiting for them. Good. Um, That's so, amazing. So I felt like I got a really big leg up on my very first <laughs> round out. So the first person I killed had all of this stuff. So I of course scavenged everything that I could carry including a utility belt and I, like the, the works this person was decked out um, and then well, I, <laughs> I began I began my like uh, journey into the into the center of the circle to try to make sure that I wasn't having to run you know as they decreased the size of the <laughs> map I did hang out in like one lookout post for like a solid like probably five to seven minutes before i was like okay you know what this is boring uh, this i'm at a demo event like I'm, this is not a real match i'm gonna go i'm gonna go fuck fuck around a little bit me and my frying pan did okay i made it to 15 nice so i wow. made it i made it all the way That's down there frying pan? 
Yeah, with with my frying pan, I killed two people and I and I crept around and I hid. And what I would do is I I followed this one guy for a while who never turned around. And my intention was to kill him. Somebody killed him first. Um, but I would creep behind him and just watch everyone else kill each other. And no one was like, no one found me. I was like creeping along behind them. What got me, and it was my own stupid stupidness. <laughs> A guy was riding this little go kart, and he and the and he stopped the go kart and got out of the go kart and ran away into the forest. And I was like, "You didn't steal his go kart immediately?" No, 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 no. And I was like, "Hey, that guy left his go kart. I'm gonna take it." And I ran up, and right before I got into it, the guy jumped out of the bushes and shot me because the go kart oh, he was baited bait. you. It was bait. Oh. I was like, never trust a go kart. No. It was so cool looking at a bucket seat in the back in case I wanted someone to come with me. I was like, God damn it. But I made it all the way down to 15 with my frying pan. That's pretty so, amazing. You know me. I get hung up on weird things. And I think I'm going to try it again. And I'm going to go find my frying pan and go try it. Yeah, I, I get it now. I get why people love this game and why it's so popular and people are having so much fun. And playing it on controller felt so good. And... I think the Elite controller was maybe a little unnecessary for PUBG. I think that controller is designed for a more uh, action-oriented experience <laughs> and not me just like sitting in a corner of a room waiting for someone to open the doors. So I can shoot them in the face like a sucker. Um, but uh, it felt good. It looked good. The The textures and the graphics looked really nice, um, you know, running on Xbox One X and um, I'm really excited. I'm ready. I'm ready for this game to come out and for for us to play it together and to have a good time playing on console together. So looking yeah. forward to seeing what they're going to do with PUBG. Um, other games, obviously their 10 pole title that they had at this event, Forza Motorsport 7. Now, I'm not a big simulation racing fan. Uh, you guys on the podcast and the, and the YouTube channel have heard me talk before how much I love arcade racing games and how I'm looking forward to Need for Speed. So... I was hesitant to try this knowing that I was like, oh, I'm probably going to crash and, you know, not do well. But I was like, I have to give it a shot. It looks so pretty. I mean, Turn 10 just doing a fantastic job with this game. It looks awesome. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised by how easy it was for me to pick it up and play it. And I had a lot of fun with it. What they've done with each iteration of Forza is that they've continued to add layers of um, customization into the gameplay experience. Obviously, customization with cars is like a big thing, but I like how they've introduced mechanics where I can turn on, you know, the the brake assist. I can turn on weather effects. I can, you know, turn on, you know... Um, hints and tips from the game telling me when I'm supposed to make a, a turn, when I'm supposed to break, when I'm supposed to do this. And you can turn all of it off if, you, if you're the kind of person who doesn't want any assist from the AI or the computer whatsoever. You can turn it all off and go your own way. But I like for someone like me who's very intimidated by simulation racers that I can actually experience Forza and have a good time playing that game and, and you know be part of you know, that community of people who absolutely love simulation racers. And I think that that's great. Um, did you ladies get a chance to try it? I don't do anything vaguely sports related. <laughs> it's not even vaguely sports. It's a, it's a car game. What are you talking about? I'm bad at driving cars in real life. Why would I drive the video game? Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you had fun. Yeah, I didn't try it either, mostly because I was just like, eh. And number one, I don't like racing games that much. Number two, if I'm going to play a racing game, I'm going to play an arcade racer. Um, so I just, they had like the big rig set up there, like where you could sit and pretend like you were driving the car and a big ass screen. But I just felt zero desire to go do it. There so weren't I any didn't. hot boys in the car. <sighs> what I did do. Wait, oh, before you move on okay. to another game, I just want to yeah. say, as... I get, I get what you, I get your point, ladies. I understand that you're like, no, nope, not for me. I would say to people out there who are listening to the show, who are maybe in your boat, who have maybe ever at the littlest inkling been intrigued by a Forza game. Maybe you like the Forza Horizon series because it is more of an arcade style, or maybe you've seen some trailers and you're like, wow, the graphics look really beautiful. Or maybe you're planning to buy an Xbox One X. Um, or you have an Xbox One S and you want another game to play, this is one of Microsoft's 
only <laughs> first party games that is going to be coming out in the next six months, really. Um, and I would encourage you to maybe just give it a whirl. They have a demo, you know, just try it out. If that's this all. was a Forza Horizon, I'd be way more into it. Way more into it. Why do you say that? Because Forza Horizon, like she just said, is, is more of an arcade racer. It's a little bit more like rough and tumble. It's yeah. It's less. <laughs> it's not focused on the racing aspect of uh, of the mechanics. It's focused on more of like the open world, like have fun, go out. You you can kind of crash your car around. It's not a big deal. You're not like stuck to a track. You know, using like the laws of physics. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Physics. It's a little bit more free form. Yeah. Physics. Yes. Okay, but you were going to say Steimer. Oh, I said what caught my eye, and that I don't know if it, either of you ladies care about it, but I was very excited and actually ran over to the demo station and was like, this is a thing, I forgot that this was a thing. Um, Age of Empires. Oh yeah, it's a big thing. A lot of people are really excited about that. I was very excited because I grew up playing Age of Empires. I grew up playing a lot of RTS games because that's what my dad played a lot of, and so I would just like sneak onto his computer and play whatever he had. Um, so I just like have such fond memories of Age of Empires, but then of course when I loaded into the game, I was like, I've forgotten how to play this. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh. oh crap! It's been a long time, so I had to have someone like, please re-explain this game to me because they, the demo they dump you into isn't a tutorial. It's they basically just give you all of these resources. You already have a bunch of armies built. Um, so he was like, no, this the demo thing we have is. Essentially, you just take your armies and like wander around the map and see who you can kill. And I was like, I'm down with that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of what it is, or the demo was. And I'm just, I'm really excited. I'm excited for this because I think I'm going to get it for my dad. And then I want to play it. And then like, we can have something to talk about again game wise because he plays a lot of, he still plays a lot of RTSs that I don't play. But now I'm like, we can rebond over this super old game. Aww. And I'm excited about that. Yeah, that's great. I love that. I think a lot of people out there feel the same way you do that have a connection to this game from when they played the original or, you know, played other similar PC games. And I think it's great that Microsoft is doing a lot more to kind of connect their console and their PC audience. Obviously, it behooves them from a financial perspective, but so many of us grew up playing PC games and have either, if you're like me, you've shifted to console because it's a little bit more plug and play and it's, you know, less time consuming. Um, or, you know, y you only play PC games. So I like or that. Or you're like me and you have all of them. <laughs> Well, I have all of them now, but I mean, there was a long period of time where I only had one console because I wasn't working full time professionally in video games. And like most people out there, that's all I could afford was one console. Yeah, so that's fair. Um, yeah, it looks good. They're doing they're doing good work. Um, so I wanted to talk just briefly before we move on to some other impressions um, about the, uh, the hardware uh, and how you guys have heard me talk on this show and some other shows that I've made appearances on that I've been pretty skeptical about the Xbox One X and saying, I don't know if Microsoft has demonstrated why people should spend money on this. $500 is a lot of money for a console. It's not priced to compete with PlayStation 4 Pro. I'm just like, I very much was not sold. After getting some pretty extensive hands-on time both at PAX West and at this showcase, I'm starting to understand why people who are Xbox fans are really excited about the Xbox One X. And um, I had the opportunity to get a demo of the new user interface that they are launching for Xbox, which will happen for both well, not for both, for all three Xbox Ones in the ecosystem will get this new UI update. Did either of you see the the demo no, of the no. new UI that they're doing? I, I want to see it. So they have been... Um, <laughs> Xbox has changed their user interface. It's uh, bad now. It used to be good. Yeah, quite a few times over the last couple of years. And it kind of feels like they just keep plugging away making more stuff um but this time it feels it feels good does it, it feel more like the 360 it does Ooh. It, Ooh. so Ooh. they've really cleaned up the home page um they've changed the way that the pins work uh they've changed the tiles on the front page they've made the store a lot uh cleaner the the 
what the demonstration I saw like was like a huge sigh of relief for me because I felt like right now it just feels like I'm constantly being bombarded by marketing for stuff that I do not care about at all. And so now they've put the, like the, my games and apps like front and center on the homepage. So you don't have to scroll to find it. Oh, good. Um, Good. I was really, really pleased by the changes that they're making. Um, I didn't get a specific date as to when that's going to be rolling out, but I believe it's going to be rolling out um, in the very near future. Um, I will update time. you guys as soon as I get specifics on that. But um, Andrea, do you miss when you logged into your 360 and you saw all of the avatars? Oh yes, of all of your friends. We talked about it. that. So I got to sit down with um, Albert Panella, the senior director for Xbox Console Marketing, and he and I he showed me a whole PowerPoint presentation <laughs> about um, the hardware for Xbox One X because there I saw he was over in the corner and like no one was talking to him and I was like no people have <laughs> questions people have well because everyone was in line to play Cuphead let's just be honest oh, okay. um, I was like I have questions because people have questions about this hardware and the messaging was confusing coming out of e3 a lot of people were like xbox one s xbox one x what's the difference besides you know one's half price of the other one like why do i need it why should i upgrade and there was a lot of people who even still today are like how they have these questions and so i was like let's talk so he sat me down and we we chatted about it and he gave me the demo of the new the new UI and I was like I had to tell you that I'm a vocal skeptic of Xbox One X and he was like oh yeah he's like well maybe I can change your mind and I was like well so far I said Warner Brothers and um, Ubi and Ubisoft have have really intrigued me your partner titles look fantastic I mean after we played Shadow of War and Assassin's Creed Origins on the X I was like wow okay. I guess I got to start saving up for a 4K TV because those games look incredible. So he, we were chatting and he really walked me through what this piece of hardware can do. And it was so helpful that I was like, why, why aren't you guys talking about this in a real way? So basically, the Xbox One X is a much more powerful version of the Xbox One. Now, I know that sounds simple for me to say, like, duh, Andrea, of course. Uh, <laughs> that's what they said. It better be for $500. <laughs> but I think for when I when I look at what, what does that mean? What does that actually like translate into more powerful? And I was confused that about 4K gaming and what the 4K they do actually is versus what the 4K the Xbox One S can do and the 4K that the PS4 Pro can do. So Xbox One S cannot do 4K gaming at all. It can only do 4K video, Blu-ray, and 4K okay. streaming. Okay. So that was important for me to know. I was like, okay, that's good to know. So if I'm looking to play games in 4K, I cannot do it on my Xbox One S. I have to get the Xbox One X. Um. And the 4K on Xbox One versus the 4K on PlayStation 4 Pro um, has to do with like the native resolution. And he showed me a demo where they were like, this is the box of what 720p looks like. And this is the bigger box that 1080p looks like. This is what upscaled 4K looks like. And this is the gigantic box that is true 4K uh, resolution. And I was like, okay, when you like lay it all out like that, now I kind of understand exactly the data that's coming through the signal that's going to your TV and what that translates into from like a pixels per inch kind of perspective. Now, I really got into the weeds with him. And I'm not going to do that here because I can see you kind of glazing over just a little bit. But what I'm going to what I'm planning to do is I'm going to um, transcribe the interview that I did with him and I'm going to put it up on our blog. What's good games dot com. So if you guys are interested in learning more about the weeds, the tech of Xbox One X and what makes it different and why it's the price that it is and how it represents kind of the top tier console gaming experience for people who are who want the big fancy thing, who want the biggest iPhone with the biggest hard drive and the fanciest screen, right? People who are like, I want that cool big thing and how they're delivering on that. I have specifics on that for you so i'm gonna send you guys to again what's good games.com if you want to learn more about that so did either of you pick up 
the console because I remember I was like, oh, it's little and it looks like a PS4 Pro, which you can hold with one hand. And yes. then I tried to lift it and I was like, uh, it's heavy. I need to lift more. It's heavy. Well, in order to make it that small, they had to make it dense, right? Oh, the- no, that's what I just want to point that out to people who like might not know because I do like the PS4 kind of is like or a PS4 Pro is, I think, fairly light. I mean, it's not the lightest thing in the world, but it's not. Ain't nothing on this big boy. Like he's tiny, <laughs> but he's he's thick. <laughs> he's thick. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Where is it? Uh, yeah. So, um, kind of pivoting away from that, um, I got to play a couple other games, and Alexa, I believe you got to play some of these games as well. We both we got did. to play The Evil Within Two. We did. So I went into this appointment. Kicking and screaming. I did not want to play this game. I hate scary games, but I tried to imagine Brittany sitting on my shoulder going, you could do it, Andrea. You could do it. So I did it. Um, She wouldn't be that kind. She would just be like, bitch, get in there. (laughs) (laughs) That's probably true. Uh, What did you think? So I spent the whole demo, which was about an hour, like curled up in my seat waiting for a jump scare that never came. Okay. That game is at its best when it is quiet and just weird and it makes you think that something is going to like pop out and jump in your face and scream and it doesn't. And when the thing comes, there's like a lead up to it and then it's just like total disgust at whatever you're looking at. I think that's, I mean, I can't handle jump scares and that makes me really anxious, but it's really, it's a great, it's great game design. Yeah, it's I, good. the the sound design and the music yeah, the is so design. excellently done. Oh Walking God. through the hallways of this building um, and turning around and it, the, it's gone. Like where you were doesn't exist anymore. They've completely like shape shifted the the level, and it's it's it messes with your mind in a really freaky way that I think survival horror fans are going to eat with a spoon. It's really upsetting, which I think is what they're going for. Yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's a boss fight at the beginning of the demo that we played. And this <sighs> boss creature oh my God. was uh, one of the most horrifying things I've ever seen. I want to know like how, who thinks up this stuff? Shinji who, Mikami. Right. Like who's sitting around like, <laughs> like looking like, and then it's like, I'm going to make a monster that's like all of these legs tied together and it's going to have these different faces and then it's going to scream as it runs at you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, it's, it's horrifying in a really it's real leg way. Man. Leg, he la- does all leg the lady. Squats. Leg lady. <laughs> oh, sorry, Was it a lady? lady? Was it a lady? It had lady faces, but it had different types of body parts, um, uh, different <laughs> genders at the bottom. That, okay. that boss was upsetting, but the boss at the end of the level upset me more. Um, I'm sure you'll get, you will all see it in footage as all of the footage drops today, but it's a camera. It's like an old timey camera attached to this like woman's body. And then there's like eight legs and the thing like, it's like a spider lady, spider, spider, yeah, spider lady camera. Mm -hmm. And, and she like kind of moans in a weird way. She makes these orgasmic moans and it's really, Ugh. it's just really discomforting and it's really awful, which I guess is, is good here. But I kind spent that entire demo, I was recording and I lost my recording, but I was recording and there was the thing happening on the screen and then the thing happening on the little the little um, screen of the thing that I was recording from. And I was so anxious and so scared. I had like my eyes closed and I was watching it out of the corner of the tiny screen because I couldn't (laughs) handle what was happening on the big screen. I was like so grossed out. And like every time she would moan, I'd be like, just get me out of this demo. Amazing. It's so gross. I have a question because so I don't, I'm like you guys, I don't like playing scary games. So I pretty much just ignore these when you say boss fight, are you shooting this thing? Like, is this a shooter? Yeah, you're shooting it. Okay. Well, you or can shoot it. it. Um, yeah, there's melee weapons as well. But a lot of these um, are uh, runaway fights. Like, you don't, Run away. Like you don't oh. engage in fight, but some Not of them you have to fight, course. you have to defeat, and then some of them you ha- can, like, you, there's no winning. You have to just escape. Yep. Uh, so it's like a combination. Got it. But, um... 
I did feel a little lost not having finished the first game from a story perspective. So I would recommend to people if you are planning to check this game out and you didn't play the first one, you might want to just read like a Wikipedia like refresher yeah. on the story so you don't feel as lost as I did. But the graphics look great. The sound design is awesome. The level designs look really sharp. Um, I think people are going to really like this game. Yeah. So it looked um, it looked good. It's creepy. Did you play Doom on Switch? I did, and something seems so like incongruous and contradictory about saying like I played Doom on Switch because you have this <laughs> super family friendly console, fun for all ages, and then Doom. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. It, but you know what? It like they so did it I run well. Yeah, so I played it with I played it with the thing with the thing propped up the screen propped up using a pro controller, and then I played in handheld mode. And you know what? Both ways were actually pretty comfortable. I was comfortable in handheld mode. However, the pro controller is the superior method. With the fast paced action of Doom, I would not recommend playing it in handheld mode. I really want to see that game in docked mode to see what it looks like on a full-size television because I felt like it was moving a little bit too fast for me to really con- continue to m- keep track of what was happening on that tiny screen. So this yeah. game is a beautiful-looking game on the other consoles and on PC, and um, I-, I really wish I would have been able to see it in docked mode because I know that there are some concerns from a graphic perspective, not only with this game, but Wolfenstein also is coming to yes. Switch next year, and they've already talked about how the frame rates are going to be dropped for that game. Um, but um, it played excellently. It it did. I had fun with it, but the thing I kept do I kept trying to do is when I was in handheld mode, I would want to use the Switch's motion control features and I would want to turn and shoot. And I kept, and I, you, it's not built in. You can't do that. You have to just use the, the joysticks. And I asked the rep that was there, I'm like, hey, what's up? Like, are you, have you considered motion controls? Because after playing like Splatoon and ARMS and all these games that use the motion controls, I feel like that would be a really excellent thing for Doom. And she said that Bethesda is currently doing a bunch of research into adding it. So if that cool, if that game launches with the motion controls, I'll be super happy. But it's fun. I'm probably going to play Doom again. Excellent. Doom. Um, I also played Ooh. Fallout 4 Ooh. and Skyrim in virtual reality. Did you do any of the VR demos? Nope. VR makes me barf. So about that, I got out of VR real quick because I got... I got I got oh, queasy. No. So I've done plenty of VR before and not never had any issues. It's I don't know which it's, headset was it. So I played um, Fallout with the Vive room scale, and I played Skyrim with PSVR. Hmm. So, huh? And both made you sick. Yeah. So here's the thing: um, the movement system is not final. And it's obvious that it's not final. Um, I asked them about it. So the, in Skyrim, it was a teleport system, like we've seen in several VR titles, where you kind of point and then you instantly teleport ahead. And after spending hundreds of hours in Skyrim on console, like I don't know why I would want that experience mm. to be because you you spend so much time walking around or on your horse or just moving through oh, the environment. God having to teleport like we're talking like three feet ahead of you like it's like click 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 click. it was it did not it did not feel good at all um i also had a really tough time because in order to turn i had to physically turn oh oh, so when i was in um when i was in fallout for example and i was in room scale they have a feature where you can actually use the joystick to move so you're not doing the little teleporting um and so i I was like hey can we turn that on so i can see what it looks like he's like sure so turn it on but there was no stick for me to move my my the the camera angle that you're looking with just the movement if i wanted to turn my head to the left um and and move i i if i sorry Excuse me. If I had, if I wanted to move to the left, I had to physically turn my head and then move my with my joystick. So imagine, if you will, 
that you're in a boss fight or you're being attacked by, you know, whatever various oh rad God. creatures that are in the world of Fallout. You're describing this and I'm getting nauseous <laughs> thinking about it. It was, it was rough. It, was, it doesn't sound good. I think the idea of these two games, these two amazing open world games in VR sounds really great. The implementation is not ready yet. And they're both slated to come out before the holiday. No. So I think I, I don't, I'm not somebody who gets excited about like a hundred hour RPG in VR because I don't want to stay in VR for that long. You're also like, not someone who gets excited about Skyrim. No, the problem is people who own. I like Skyrim fine. I just don't need 10,000 versions of it. <laughs> right. But if the people who own VR, whether it be Oculus or Vive or PSVR, those people want AAA experiences in VR. Like that's all over the blogs is Reddit. Like people who follow VR shows, like they're waiting for like a definitive, you know, AAA VR experience from a developer from a franchise that we know. I mean, there's been some pretty amazing VR games that have come out already. Um, but it's, I don't know. It just didn't feel right. Um, I don't know if it's a frame rate issue or if it's something you just need to get used to, but it's tough taking a game that I've played for so many hours and then putting me in this new experience and me having to want to move quickly. And the VAT system trying to do that quickly in vr woof oh my gosh it was did you just say woof? i did woof. <laughs> woof. i did I like, like oh, i did man. like that i got to see dog meat again but like it was dog oh. meat. it was tough it, it was cool kind bringing up my pip boy so if i raised my arm with the vive controller uh the pip boy came up uh on my arm that's and, cool and i was like okay that's awesome um, but trying to navigate that quickly because, I mean, when you're in these games, whether it be Skyrim or Fallout, you ne- you're in the, in and out of the menus all the time in combat and it just wasn't fluid and I probably just needed more practice with the menus, but the movement system was rough. So oh, Jesus. I was, uh, I was disappointed. That is disappointing. Yeah. Um, we also played... Wolfenstein, but we can't talk about it yet. I'm a Not little, yet. I'm a little frustrated. So, but we might be able to talk about that. I believe on next week's show. Mm-hmm. Um, I also remind p- me when that's coming out again. Isn't it soon? Very soon, October. No, October. Yeah, October. Okay. Um, it looks good. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, there was another game that Brittany and I played, but I'm gonna wait to talk about it with her next week. It's the Planet of the Apes: The Last Frontier. This is from Andy Circus's uh, mm. studio, Imaginarium. And it's a really unique experience. So we'll talk about that on next week's show. Um, Steimer, you Mm -hmm. and I have been playing Destiny 2. And I don't want to get into another Destiny sinkhole here. But (laughs) I completed the raid last night. (laughs) You did. (laughs) At 2.30 in the morning. (laughs) Congratulations. Thank you. Did you get anything good? Yes. I got an amazing rocket launcher. And I got almost the full gear set. I'm only missing the chess piece because all of the tokens from last week when I didn't finish the raid were still in my inventory, thankfully. And so when I finally got to go meet the vendor who you cash those tokens in with, I was able to get a bunch of stuff. But So there's a token system. That's good. Yeah. So for reference to people who did missed my streams of the raid, I spent... 20 hours over three separate sessions taking on the raid. Last night, I got into a group who were all leveled 290 to 305, except for wow. me. I was 288, 289 uh, going into the, the raid with them, and we finished it in three hours. Wow. So this is a problem that Bungie is saying the recommended light level for the raid is 260 to 280. I say definitively, do not go into the raid if you are less than 280, unless you have a group of people who are 290 and above who will carry you through the raid. Because you will just get so frustrated because your damage to the enemies in each of the instances and then the ultimate DPS phase of the boss just is going to be so maddeningly slow. Is that a word? Maddeningly? Yeah. Madden- maddeningly. maddeningly. Yeah. Um, it, that you'll be like me and you'll, you'll hate yourself by the end of it. So um, <laughs> it's frustrating to me that they're not more explicit with that, that they're saying 260 to 280 is the recommended level. 
Um, truly, truly just wait. Just do the milestones, play some crucible, do some other things. If you have a group that's willing to sherpa you through like I did, great. But if you're if everyone in your fire team is below 290, I would say don't do it. <laughs> I would say wait. <laughs> wah, so. wah. That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, we have plenty of Destiny coverage on the streams and on last week's podcast. Unless, Steimer, you yes. wanted to add something else. Um, I just wanted to say, like, because we were pretty fairly critical. I'd say I was fairly critical. <laughs> I mean, I, but I still enjoyed playing it with you over the weekend. That being said, I do wonder if I'll ever get to the raid. Yes, like, we will do I'm, it together. Yeah, we'll get you there. But, I, but I've got to like, I've got to. Because we got to bring, to do. we got to bring Alexa Ray in. Mm. I saw Alexa Ray's piece on fandom. I saw that too uh, about do Destiny you want to talk Two. About it? I fucked up. I haven't started Destiny Two yet. It's but okay. I do think you got, you brought up a good point in that I don't think Destiny Two really rewards players for helping each other. Like no, in it the, doesn't in the early phases. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't necessarily have a great reason to go back and play with you until you're my level. Trophy. You, you could get care. a trophy or you could not waste <laughs> hours and hours of your life carrying me through a game. I think what it is is for people like me who really love the experience and the shooting and the world of Destiny, it's another way for me to continue playing and to, to do it in a different way because... Going as a warlock will be a different experience than playing it as a hunter. Will it be dramatically different? No, but I don't want it to be dramatically different. I like it the way it is. Um, so we'll we'll do it. We'll do it together. It'll be great. You're a good friend, Andrea. Thanks, Timer. I, I didn't play Destiny two, but I did. I did play another game. Yeah. Oh, you played. Uh, wait. Where is it? <laughs> Octopath oh, Traveler. The one I wanted to. I talked about last week. I thought it looked really good. Did you play it? No, because I played Destiny all weekend. That's my fault. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. so it's a welcome to JRPG Power Hour or two minutes. Um, <laughs> so, Octopath Traveler. It's a Square Enix JRPG, and and it's a Switch exclusive. I know. I'm super me happy. excited. It is like a 16. It's HD 2D. It's 16 bit with these little character sprites set on really great like polygonal HD backgrounds. So it's got that mix and it looks like an old classic JRPG, but it's not. It's like a new one. And the Octopath comes in that there will be eight characters and each of them has a different story and they all intertwine. And they give you the beginnings of two different characters in the demo. Uh, a retired knight who gets dragged back into the fight when his village is attacked and a dancer named Primrose. And I had a lot of people tweeting at me about... The demo is about about two hours if you complete both both um, both sections. And I had a lot of people tweeting at me about Primrose's path because they were like, oh, my God, this is like the old JRPGs. This is so like scandalous and racy. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So in the game and it's on the switch, mind you, her character, I guess, is like she she she's a daughter of a house of an old house. Her father was killed when she was a child. So she's gone out into the world in search of revenge on the three men that she saw kill her father. And she's taken up residence as a dancer in this like weird tavern. And the master is like really inappropriate and like makes all these references to her, like pleasuring him and like purring for him. And he calls her a whore. It's like very, very explicit. And I'm like, Holy shit. Whoa. Do you get to murder this man? Yes. You get to murder yeah. this. Man. Oh, excellent! But but, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you, so you, uh, each character has and has a, a unique ability uh, that can be used when they're interacting with NPCs, non-playable characters. And uh, Ulberic, the knight, can challenge anyone to a duel, so he can get in the duel, get some leveling, whatever. But Primrose can allure people, so she can convince anyone to follow her anywhere she wants. So in the demo, you have to find the richest man in town and convince him to come to the tavern with you and watch you dance because you need to make money. And you walk around town. Girl gotta eat. And her her voice acting, the voice acting in this game is just so good. She walks, she walks up to dudes and she's like, excuse me. And they're like, hello. And she's like, come hither. And I'm like, Jesus, this is like a really like... <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I feel strange things inside. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> should I be playing this? This is like a adult game. 
I'm an adult. But like it's like the 900 numbers of your. Yeah, and it's really and it's like oh and it's super duper racy and you uh and then you you find one of the men who's killed your father and you go looking for him. Um your your friend dances in your place and you sort of go into the catacombs of the city chasing after him. And the battles and there's random encounters as there are in most JRPGs and it's turn-based. Um I love turn-based battles. It allows you to strategize. I really like them here. And they added the break system, which has been in a lot of recent a lot of recent JRPGs specifically where you can't immediately start dealing damage to someone. Uh, you have to break like you have to break their shield first uh, and then you can start dealing damage to them and their shield regenerates after a certain amount of turns you have to turns then you have to break it again and beat at them again so it requires a little bit of strategy so if you have two enemies and one has one shield point and one has two you have to figure out what is the cadence of their regeneration and try to knock them out both at once so you can hit them both at once and get them out uh, get them out of the ring more quickly and at the end of Primrose's path, her friend gets murdered by this guy. She gets stabbed and pushed off a cliff uh, because she covered for Primrose. And then Primrose turns to this master and goes, master, go pleasure yourself. And then they fight. Um, very, very racy. I really like the writing. Like the dialogue is really, really good. Like the weird, like raciness is actually kind of, kind of like fun in a way. And it looks really good. And the combat's really great. And I'm really excited. I guess it's coming early next year. And I'm really excited about it because I feel like we get, we have all these series like Final Fantasy, like Dragon Quest, like Tales, where we just get, you know, game after game that's the same with like a tweak, whether it's a new story or it's just another combat layer added onto it, um, or it's the same conceit with like one wrinkle. And I'm really excited to, to see this game because it just looks and feels totally new while also making me feel like nostalgic. Like so many... Square Enix is really trying to call back to the golden era of JRPGs with like the Tokyo RPG Factory games and Final Fantasy 15 Pocket Edition. The sprite art style was based on the Final Fantasy 7 polygonal style, trying to call back to that. Um, so it's interesting to see them go in on it so much in so many different ways. I f- um, do you know, oh wait, they haven't sent the survey out yet, right? Because like you're supposed to play the demo and then they're going to send a survey The survey's out. at the end of the demo. Oh, is it? Yeah. What, what, what did it say? What did they want to know? It's like what what's more important to you and like what do you look for in in you know in your in your games like basically asking you what you look for in games like this. You should play oh. it. It's like 2 hours. If you finish one path, then you'll then I believe you'll get it, but you should definitely check it out. Cool. Yeah. I like it. I, I think it looks cool. Free demo. Get it. Yeah, do it. Do it for me, your JRPG friend. Okay. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, that has been our hands-on segment for the show for this week. Uh, when we come back, we have a little bit of reader mail. So stay with reader us. Reader mail. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. So this is the part of the show where we kind of, you know, fly by the seat of our pants, do what we're feeling like this week. And this week, we decided to answer one of your questions. So we got an email from Brandon. Email. And Brandon says, hey, what's good games? I was curious if there were any games with unique combat systems for their genre that really stand out for you. Mine would have to be the last remnant for Xbox 360. Even though the rest of the game was pretty standard fare, the Union system was an awesome change of pace for most of the JRPGs I've played. Thanks for the great show and have a good one. I thought this was a really interesting question. Because combat is such an important part of games that have, you know, an action system. Mm. And for me, the first one that I think of immediately is the Nemesis system in Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor from 2014. That's a good one, yeah. So that we've talked a little bit about that franchise and that with the upcoming arrival of Shadow of War. And uh, what I really loved about the Nemesis system was because so many times when you're in these kind of hack and slash or brawler games, the enemies just seem so formulaic. They seem like they're copy pasted almost where you're just finding the same types of bosses over and over again. And don't get me wrong. Games like Assassin's Creed where you go in and you, you know, slash your way through a bunch of guards and like red robes or whatever. It's still fun, but none of those guards have personalities. They all have like the same, you know, rotating 
dialogue lines while you're hiding in the bushes waiting. They all kind of say the same things, but that was not the case in a Shadow of Mordor. And I think that that's a testament to the work that Monolith did on the Nemesis system and the really innovation that they created with the combat so that when you were out in the world as Talion, as this hero, and you're fighting against these different types of orcs, they really felt unique. They remembered you, they remembered your battle and how the fight went down. And if you didn't defeat them, if they defeated you and you ran into them later in the game, like there would be a unique interaction. And everyone's playthrough was a little bit different because of that. And I know you both obviously sunk a bunch of hours into that game. A bunch of bunch yes, of hours. Yes, I did. The weird part, I think this was a bug, but there were definitely orcs that I decapitated that came back. And I was like, whoops. Uh. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> I was like, that was a serious flesh wound you had. <laughs> health, health insurance in Mordor must be excellent. <laughs> yeah, right? Prime, amazing wound. medical care. <laughs> well, I mean, they do work for like, you know. Get me on that PPO, the Lord of Darkness. So. <laughs> they just like put them back into the mud. And like, re- <laughs> we can rebuild you. We oh, have God. the technology. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think their premiums are exactly um so i really like the way that they combine not only the nemesis system but they took kind of what i thought were some of the awesome elements of the combat flow that we saw in the arkham series um from you know uh another warner brothers published title maybe they collaborated with rocksteady on some of the cool combat that they had there and then they combined it with some of these cool supernatural abilities uh that we get from you know Celebrimbor, the you know the ghost side of, of talion and really made a nice blend of this human that's still a man being really powerful but also bringing in these cool you know ghost powers thank you for i like the ghost powers a lot thank (laughs) you for putting the correct emphasis on the correct syllables in celebrimbor i just want to say i appreciate that (laughs) you're welcome (laughs) oh i love it celery celery man is that his name I'm just kidding. Uh, Celerimbor. 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 Um, so that's uh, that's the one that I that I really like. Steimer, is there one that you um, that stands out for you? A, a unique combat for their genre. So I think when Fallout made the transition from a top-down game to number one, a first-person shooter or third-person, like you know, you could do, switch back and forth. I think that was pretty crazy for the time and then also when they added in the VAT system um, again I think it's more of just the perspective because um, I played some of the older fallouts and like it, they, they seem similar but just the way that they'd taken it um, and transformed the game I thought it was really cool and really well done and that is not a new game by any means but it was just the one thing I could think of where I was like that was neat that they did that um, because for the most part I think combat nowadays there's not a whole lot necessarily like special like there's a lot of similarities among games nowadays things kind of just like well we're going to take a little bit from column A and a little bit from column B and make it into this thing and it's all stuff you've kind of seen before well if you dig into the wild world of JRPGs that shit's all over the place Christine (laughs) what do you mean the sameness no or the, the, the weird new stuff Ooh, weird new stuff. Well, Tell us about your weird new stuff from JRPG land. So, I, I mean, hearkening back to my conversation a few weeks ago about Xenoblade Chronicles 2 and how just batshit that is with mechanics, I would say unique combat systems that work and are awesome. Uh, I have to go with Bravely Default on 3DS. Uh, Bravely Default, same old JRPG, turn-based, blah, blah, blah. Powerful attacks, power subclasses, boop, boop, boop. And um, the, uh, you have the ability to take up to four turns at once for one character. So one character can attack up to four times. It can brave and attack four times. Uh, but be, by doing that, they forfeit their next like three turns. So you can take your turns in advance for a character. Oh. So if you have a party of four and like four beasties and this one character has you know the attacks won't won't work against it you can have them default and forfeit their turn and then they can forfeit up to four of their turns and then they can have four more turns at once later but they will also be more powerful so you can switch around how many times they attack but that also changes the order of attack 
Is that a good way of like clearing trash? If you're just like, I'm yes. gonna take all four right now yep. instead of waiting. If you are grinding the the if you are grinding and there's a certain character that is like not leveling up as fast as everyone else, uh, you put them first in your row. You have them brave four times. They'll like shoot fire or whatever four times. The party is cleared, and then you can move on with your life and your experience points. I actually found it very easy to grind and bravely default because of that system. And it also helps against some of the bigger boss battles where they don't tell you what they're weak against and you have to figure out, then you can figure out, Oh, my number one party member is, you know, they're a mage and this is like strong against mages. So we'll have them default, 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 or use their turns to just throw potions at people. And I'll have my three attackers all attack, um, twice in a row to get their minion out of the way. So then I can focus on the bad guy. Like it's actually pretty strategic. I like it. And it's very I'm not sure how new it is, but you talking about that made me think of Guild Wars too. Shocker. Oh, did it? Did it? Shocker. Shock and did awe. It? I don't know how necessarily unique it, will, it is in the genre space because I haven't played every MMO ever created. But um, Why not, I really like their combo system. Slacking. I know, right? <laughs> Why don't you have all of the time in the world? Because uh, no we're spending family, it with no you friends. on the internet. It's true. But um, what I like about it is, like, the, you can technically kind of ignore the combo system that they have. You're not going to be optimal by any means. Um, but in regular PvP, you can play a role of warrior and, like, face tank if you really want to. If you're terrible at the game. Face but, tank? <laughs> you never heard that term? No. It's basically, like, if you just stand in front of an enemy and just, like, hit them and you're not moving or straight, like, you're not doing anything, you're face tanking, face you're tanking tank. with your face. I'm a face tank. <laughs> I love when you gesture wildly with your hand and you put it in front of your camera. And it goes out of focus. It focuses oh. on your hand instead of on your face. Your camera's getting confused. <laughs> sorry, sorry, camera. I talk with my hand. <laughs> but so what they have in this is so each class has access to combo fields. Um, they can be either a circle, combo circle, or... I think they have like strips or whatever. Anyway, there are combo fields and then there are combo finishers. And the finishers can be different. So you can use a combo blaster on a water field, for instance, and mass heal people around you. Or if it's fire, um, you can blast the fire and then it will get you what are called stacks of might, which greatly increase your damage. So they have each one. There's like there's fire, there's lightning. Like everything has its own thing. Like something stack vulnerability. Like so, if you are playing higher end content, you really do need to be paying attention to these things, and you need to be, you know, timing your combos properly, working with your groups. So you're like, all right, guys, I'm gonna like lay down a combo field. Everybody blast it. Use your blast finishers on it. There's also projectile finishers. Ooh. So if you were to shoot an arrow through a fire field, it would become like it would burn the enemy. So they have a lot of really interesting things with that that make the combat just a little bit more interesting than your basic J uh, MMO style combat. Mm. That is interesting. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about uh, a little indie darling from Capybara Games called Super Time Force. Um, Ooh, yeah. so this one, I remember when I first saw this game, I was like, wait, what's happening? Um, this is a really cool game. It's a, it's a side-scrolling action game, but uh, when you die, your ghost kind of uh, rewinds, and then you play alongside that character through the level. And so you can strategically die in specific spots to make sure that you have a ghost that helps you get through a certain level. And oh. then you have a, a, like a bunch of different like ghosts like running th through the level with you. And they're all doing an action at the same time. And it was, it was a lot to process at first. But um, I thought what they were doing was, was, was really cool. And obviously the game's you know, out on all the platforms now. But did you guys ever get a chance to play this when it first came out? I played a little bit of it, but not a lot. I thought that what they were doing with combat was uh, really interesting. Um, so I just wanted to give them a little nod. But um, the game, of course, that most recently has won me over with their combat, of course, is Horizon Zero Dawn. Now, I don't but know. Would you call anything unique about it? It's not really unique. You mean oh, the way that you have to constantly be changing all of your ammo types based off the beast that you're fighting? And you, you do that. I don't change too. my ammo types that often. Really? Well, I did just fine. Oh. Yeah. You, you do that in Zelda, too. Yeah. Zelda's yeah. combat is... No, no, no. Listen. There, let me break down the difference. Like, I'm enjoying Zelda. N not saying that. But the 
changing your ammo types in, in Zelda is not nearly as um, integrated into the combat system the way it is in Horizon. Like using a bomb arrow to take, sure, you to know, take the armor off before you pierce. Yeah, yeah okay. is not the same as like I have to use this one type of arrow against this one type of beast, or I will not be able to defeat it. Like, you know, wouldn't you say? Sure, you're right. Alexa you to, like, couldn't say because she hasn't arrow. played Horizon. No, yet. I played two hours of it. That's not enough. I'm gonna finish it. I have to finish it before certain things happen this year. Yes. Yes. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> um. Another game with combat, it's not combat really, but what I like, so I'm, this is a major throwback. Monkey Island, your combat in that game was throwing insults at each other. Are we and playing Steimer Bingo? Because you've brought up an old adventure game and Guild Wars. Yep. Wait, you know what's we next? Tonight. Viva Pinata? <laughs> <laughs> There's no combat. You can whack things with shovels, that's pretty fun. There's no combat, just sweet, sweet. Love no, you making... can't. I mean, combat, you can kill the pinatas. You can smash them to death. Yeah, but who would do that? Stein no, was like, I, I would smash, do that. I don't, you don't smash. There are, there are evil, like, weed pinatas that you smash. Okay. That will destroy your garden. All right, that's fair. Yeah. As long as you're not <laughs> smashing the good pinatas. No, no. The good pinatas can stay. What's interesting about this discussion is that it's off the rails again. <laughs> well, no, not that. Well, this whole show is off the rails. Um, is that I love when people write in or leave comments or tweet to us or write on Facebook and say, "Well, did you think about this?" And I find that so fascinating because you know we're sitting here talking about things that we've thought of, and you know Brandon had his example which I'd never played, and I wonder what people out there are going. Oh, you think that that's unique, but maybe you didn't know about this game over here. Um, mm -hmm. What what were you gonna say? It was he it was he was talking about a, JR, a JRPG. Yeah. Which is why I, Alexa's like, I've played I'm it. I'm triggered. I'm so triggered right now. <laughs> but in a good way or a bad way? In a good way. way. It's a good trigger. Okay, good triggering. My people, they're out there. What yes. about, what about in... Hitman, guys? Where you shoot guns at people? Well, no, no, no. no like the, the fact the... that you can solve the level in like multiple different ways. Like do kind of, you can kill them how you want to kill them. <laughs> I thought so excellently done. I was really kind of cornered the market because they didn't just make a stealth game, right? Like it's easy to blanket statement the Hitman series as like a stealth action adventure game, but it's so much more than that. There's They're so like much puzzles. strategy involved. Exactly. It's like puzzle solving within puzzle a murder. shooter. My favorite kind. <laughs> puzzle murder. <laughs> That's a great example. Is there a particular Hitman that you found um, exciting for you? I No. But just the, in general, I thought it would be a good example of this. Yeah, I hope that somebody, I hope they don't stop making Hitman games, you know, since their departure from, from Square Enix. I hope that they continue making cool stuff because the, in particular, the last one that they made was so really good. excellently done. Um, if you guys haven't gotten a chance to pick that up, all of the episodes are now out. Um, so you can buy all of it on a single disc. And that came out last year. And I think they're still doing some live updates with the game. I don't know if that's still mm -hmm. active uh, now. But if you missed it, yeah, Hitman's a, a great example. I can't remember. There was one level that I was playing. And I think one of the developers told me there was like 27 different ways you could take the target out. Wow. Or something crazy like that. Um, See, I love that. I love that. Yeah, it's awesome. It's all about player choice and kind of letting people figure out how they're going to get there. I mean, there were games like like Uncharted 4 where there were some levels where they gave you a, like the illusion of player choice. Like, oh, you could run this path or this path. But really there was like four or five paths total. Like the idea that they're making all of these different branches that will then, you know, bring you back to a specific spot is really cool. And I think Shadow of War is doing something very similar to that as well, which is excellent. Yay. So, uh, um, ladies, can you think of any other examples or should we wrap this shebang up? I think it's shebang time. Shebang time. Put, put a bow on it. Um, put a bow on it. As we mentioned at the top of the show, next week we will be doing our Patreon exclusive streams, our happy hour Q&A, and our after hour stream. If you want to get in on those streams, you got to be part of our Patreon community at patreon.com slash what's good games. Um, I also want to give a little nod to an event that 
Steimer, Brittany, and I are going to the XBO convention in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's October 13th through the 15th. We will be doing some panels that Saturday. Uh, we will be, you know, taking pictures and hopefully hanging out with you guys. If you live in the South or in near Oklahoma and you guys are looking for a gaming convention to go to, I highly recommend uh, you check it out. Tickets are still available for that. I believe the website is uh, I spelled it wrong. Hold on. Let me make sure I get it right. Yeah. Expo Tulsa.com. So that's X P O Tulsa.com. You can check out all the details on that. A bunch of other uh, people we know from the industry are going to be there, which is, which is cool. So if you want to see, have a great time. Yeah. Some other streamers, Bye. YouTubers, video game development folk, um, check it out. Um, Brittany was, we'll be back next week. That's Yay. what I was going to say. Yeah. We've well, missed her, excited. but she'll be back. And uh, we're going to talk about the stuffs. Um, I feel like I there's something I'm missing. I'm forgetting to say. Did I get it all? Um, yes? yes? Question mark? <laughs> yes, question mark. Well, if we forgot, you you guys will remind us. Um, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube at youtube.com slash what's good games. You can watch our Twitch archives at twitch.tv slash what's good games. And we will be back next week with another episode for your beautiful faces and ears. We love you guys. Take care. Have a great day.